On behalf of the International Association of Providers of AIDS Care, or IAPAC, welcome to our Learning Academy. I am Dr. Jose Zuniga, IAPAC's President and Chief Executive Officer. The Learning Academy's mission is to coordinate multidisciplinary online educational activities to support optimal care for people living with and affected by HIV, syndemic conditions, and comorbid diseases. Moreover, we place an emphasis on person-centered care as well as addressing challenges faced by people who are vulnerable to HIV, viral hepatitis, tuberculosis, and non-communicable diseases. This educational activity is focused on optimizing HIV clinical management. Its aim is to provide an overview of current evidence-based treatment strategies and interventions. The activity's first module addresses strategies for integrating non-oral ARV formulations into clinical practice, including topics such as clinician-patient hesitancy and promoting ART adherence. The second module addresses pros and cons of switching ARV regimens in virally suppressed patients, with a focus on effective clinician-patient dialogue about potent ART to achieve U equals U. The third module addresses ARV drug regimen selection on criteria for patients with comorbidities and integrated management of concomitant CBD, diabetes, and hypertension. Finally, the fourth module addresses the impact of HIV on chronic inflammation and the management of age-related comorbidities and frailty. My colleagues and I hope that you derive benefit from the educational content delivered by IAPAC's Vice President and Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Chris Duncombe. Welcome to this webinar on optimizing HIV clinical management. My name is Dr. Chris Duncan. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at the International Association of Providers of AIDS Care and I will be your presenter for today. This activity is accredited by the George Washington University and was made possible by an educational grant from Gilead Sciences. I have no financial disclosures. The webinar is comprised of four modules. Module one is strategies for integrating non-oral ARV formulations into clinical practice. The second module is pros and cons of switching AIV regimens in virally suppressed patients. Module three is AIV drug regimen selection criteria for patients with comorbidities. And finally, module four is HIV related chronic inflammation and the management of frailty. Let's get started by reviewing long acting preparations, both for PrEP and for treatment and some challenges and implementation strategies. The learning objective for module one is to understand strategies for integrating non-oral ARV formulations into clinical practice. First, long-acting PrEP. Results from two large efficacy trials, HPTN 083 and HPTN 084, found that injectable cabotegravir, also known as CAB-LA, given every two months, was effective as PrEP in preventing HIV in gay men and other men who have sex with men, transgender women, and cisgender women. It was approved by the US FDA as the first form of injectable PrEP in December of 2021. In long-term follow-up presented at AIDS 22 conference in Montreal, Cab LA continued to be to be 89% more effective in preventing HIV infection compared to oral tenofovir and 3TC. One concern related to Cab LA is the potential for acquiring resistant HIV when using it. Also, diagnostics currently available used for testing HIV may not be sensitive enough to detect acute HIV infection in people receiving Cab LA. Another potential implementation challenge may be the need for a private room to give an injection in the buttocks, the frequency of visits, which is every two months, the high cost and who will pay, and limited data available in pregnancy and breastfeeding women. One strategy to manage these implementation challenges and integrate non-oral preparations for PrEP into clinical care is the Biomedical Prevention Implementation Collaborative, or BIOPIC, Funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and supported by WHO and UNAIDS, the BioPIC is working to co coordinate cab -LA introduction with a strategy that prioritises strengthening health systems to deliver the drug 
supporting communities and individuals to have access to Kabele, and understanding both the cost of the product and the programs to deliver it, and how funders are going to be able to support that. Turning now to long-acting injectable preparations for treatment. Long-acting injectable cabotegravir plus rupivirine, given every four weeks, was non-inferior to oral antiretroviral therapy through 96 weeks in the ATLAS and FLAIR studies. In the ATLAS 2M study, similar efficacy through 96 weeks for cabotegravir and rupivirine was observed when it was administered every eight weeks in, instead of every four weeks. As with cabotegravir for PrEP, implementation issues related to long-acting cabotegravir and rapivirine include the potential for drug resistance, the need for a private space, and limited data in pregnancy. So what is the customised study? Customised examined implementation strategies for provi provider-administered long-acting injectable antiretroviral therapy in diverse US healthcare settings. 24 staff, physicians, injectors, administrators from eight clinics completed surveys and interviews at baseline month four and month 12. Staff found that cabotegravir and rupivirine long-acting preparation was acceptable appropriate and feasible to implement across diverse clinic types. Providers reported three successful implementation strategies. These were good communication about the target dosing window, appointment reminder systems, and designated staff accountable for appointment tracking. Top strategies for successful clinic implementation were good staff communication, teamwork, and web-based treatment planner. Let's turn now to uh, some antiretroviral drugs that are in the pipeline in development. Two new drugs include lenacapavir and islatravir. Lenacapavir is an investigational drug that has been studied to treat and prevent HIV infection. It belongs to a group of HIV drugs called capsid inhibitors, which interfere with HIV capsid a protein shell that protects HIV's genetic material and enzymes needed for replication. Islatravir is a first-in-class nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. Clinical trials involving Islatravir were halted late, late November of 2021 after decreases in white blood cells were reported in certain patients. Trials of Islatravir for treatment of HIV infection have now been restarted at a lower dose. However, trials of Islatravir for PrEP still remain on hold. Lenacapavir is being studied in the Capella trial, which is a phase 2-3 double-blind placebo-controlled global multi-centre study designed to evaluate the antiretroviral activity of lenacapavir administered every six months as a subcutaneous injection in heavily treatment-experienced people with multi-drug resistance. A new drug application was accepted by the US FDA in July of 2022 for the use of lenacapavir in this patient group. Calibrate is a phase two randomized open label active control study evaluating the safety and efficacy of lenacapavir in combination with other antiretroviral agents in treatment naive patients Finally, lenacapavir is being studied for PrEP in the PURPOSE trials. Other drugs in the development pipeline can be seen in the figure on this slide. In module two of the webinar, we will examine the pros and cons of switching antiretroviral regimens in virally suppressed patients. Here is the learning objective for the second module. The Department of Health and Human Services panels recommended reasons for optimizing antiretroviral therapy in the setting of virological suppression are to simplify a regimen, such as a two-drug regimen, to enhance, enhance tolerability, to switch to a long-acting injectable regimen, to allow the optimal use of ART during pregnancy, and to reduce costs. 
The principal goal of an antiretroviral therapy switch is to improve a patient's quality of life while maintaining virologic suppression. Of course, viral suppression is key to the U equals U messaging, which we will talk about a little bit further on in the, in the talk. The theoretical disadvantage of switching or simplification is the possibility of viral rebound. Taking this overarching goal into consideration, clinicians should consider multiple factors related to the patient's past history. These include prior antiretroviral therapy regimens, adherence and virological failures, documented drug resistance, and medication intolerances. Let's look briefly at an example of switching for simplification, in this case, switching to dual maintenance therapy. In recent years, a number of studies have examined switching to dual antiretroviral therapy. The FDA has approved the following two drug combination regimens, dolutegravir plus rupivirine, dolutegravir plus lamifidine, and long-acting intramuscular cabotegravir plus rupivirine all approved by the FDA. Following a treatment switch, patients should be evaluated closely for three months. Close monitoring includes a clinic visit or a telephone call one to two weeks after the change, a viral load test to check for rebound viremia four to eight weeks after the switch. The purpose of the close monitoring is to assess medication tolerance and to conduct targeted laboratory testing if the patient had a pre-existing laboratory abnormality or if there were potential concerns about the new regimen. For example, if, lip if a lipid abnormality was the reason for an ARV change, then fasting cholesterol subsets and triglycerides should be assessed within six months after the change in therapy. In the absence of any new complaints, laboratory abnormalities, or evidence of viral rebound at this three-month visit, clinic and laboratory monitoring of the patient may resume in a regular scheduled basis. Typically for a stable patient, that would be an annual visit. We mentioned U equals U a few slides ago, and, and why, why does U equals U matter so much? I mean, stigma is still a major barrier to, HI, to the HIV care continuum and detrimental to the well-being of people living with HIV and their partners. Institutional and self-stigma causes many people living with HIV to avoid relationships, uh, both sexual or otherwise, because of their perceived potential to transmit HIV. Undetectable equals untransmittable, or U equals U, is a powerful message that destigmatizes a HIV diagnosis and allows people living with HIV to live a normal sexual life. Adherence to antiretroviral therapy is the primary determinant of viral suppression and the risk of onward HIV transmission. Optimal adherence is an essential component of the U equals U messaging. But suboptimal adherence is a significant challenge worldwide. Adherence support intervention should be provided to all people on antiretroviral therapy. Interventions for which there is evidence of improved adherence and viral load suppression include peer counsellors, cell phone text messages, reminder devices, individual counselling, and fixed dose antiretroviral regimens taken once daily. In the next part of the webinar, we will spend some time reviewing antiretroviral drug regimen selection for patients with comorbidities. Here is the learning objective for module three. According to DHHS guidelines, an antiretroviral regimen for a treatment naive patient generally consists of the following. Two nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors plus one active ARV drug from one of three drug classes, either an integrase strand transfer inhibitor or a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor or a boosted protease, protease inhibitor boosted with a pharmacokinetic enhancer 
And there are two pharmacokinetic enhancers. One is cobicistat and the other is ritonavir. DHH guidelines further classify the following recommend, recommendations as recommended for people living with HIV. The first one is the combination of bictegravir, TAF and emtricitabine. The second one is dolutegravir plus abacavir and lamifidine. This regimen is only available for patients who are HLA B27 negative and who do not have uh, hepatitis B. Thirdly, dolutegravir plus either emtricitabine or lamivudine plus tenofovir or TAF. And finally, dolutegravir plus lamivudine, a two-drug regimen which is again not suitable for people with a viral load more than 500,000 copies, those with hepatitis B infection, and when ART is to be started before the results of genotypic testing and HPV testing are available. And this is the DHHS recommendation for the use of long-acting uh, ARVs. They say a long-acting ARV regimen is an optimised option for patients who are virologically suppressed on oral therapy for three to six months and who agree to make the frequent clinic visits needed to receive the injectable drugs. It's important to note that the combination of cabotegravir and rilpivirine has not been studied in antiretroviral therapy naive patients. In the phase three flare trial and the phase two B latte trial, ART naive patients were first treated with 20 weeks of oral therapy before switching to the long acting injectable once they were virologically suppressed. So patients without prior ART who wish to begin a long-acting regimen of cabotegravir and rilpivirine need to first start with oral treatment, become virally suppressed, and then switch. While the lifespan of people living with HIV has been extended since the advent of modern antiretroviral therapy, other non-AIDS-related comorbidities persist in these patients. An holistic approach to long-term medical care for people living with HIV is needed as people continue to age. Ongoing risk assessment, diagnosis and management is needed for the following common comorbidities. Hypertension and cardiovascular disease, weight loss and weight gain, renal impairment and chronic kidney disease, bone disease, neurocognitive dysfunction and diabetes. It is also important to note that the most commonly encountered drug interactions in the context of HIV clinical care occur between antiretroviral therapies and the medications used to treat common comorbidities. People with HIV on antiretroviral therapy have a higher prevalence of hypertension compared to HIV uninfected individuals. All people living with HIV should be screened for other risk factors for hypertension, such as tobacco smoking, obesity, physical inactivity, and unhealthy diet. People with any risk factor identified should be advised to modify their lifestyle. Screening for hypertension should form part of the regular assessment of all people living with HIV in care, with a blood pressure measurement at HIV diagnosis, at the beginning of antiretroviral therapy and at least every year after that. The clinical management of hypertension in people with HIV is similar to the general population with particular attention taken to drug interactions between antihypertensives and antiretrovirals. SIP enzyme inhibition by protease inhibitors and the pharmacological boosters, ritonavir and cobicistat, can be expected to increase levels of calcium channel blockers and beta blockers used for the treatment of hypertension. Diuretics, angiotensin conversion enzyme inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are not involved in significant SIP450-mediated interactions 
and thus have a low potential for pharmacokinetic drug interactions with any of our antiretroviral therapies. Certain ARV regimens are associated with more favourable lipid, lipid profiles than other regimens, although evidence on whether this improves cardiovascular outcomes is lacking. Consider avoiding an abacavir-based regimen, which has an increased risk of cardiovascular events in people who have other risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Boosted protease inhibitors can also increase the risk of cardiovascular adverse events. For many people with HIV, gaining weight after starting antiretroviral therapy is part of a return to health. However, some regimens are associated with greater weight gain than others, suggesting that particular drugs may contribute to weight gain. Initiation of an integrase inhibitor containing regimen particularly bictegravir and dolutegravir, has been associated with greater weight gain than a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase regimen or a boosted protease inhibitor regimen. Greater weight gain has also been observed with the initiation of TAF compared to TDF or with a switch from TDF to TAF. ARV-associated weight gain appears to disproportionately affect women and black and Hispanic people. While most weight gain is in the first year following the initiation of a drug that can increase weight, weight gain can be seen many years after and in some patients, more than 10% of body weight has occurred, leading to a diagnosis of clinical obesity. Turning now to chronic kidney disease, which is defined as a creatinine clearance of less than, less than 60 mils per minute. Individuals with HIV are at increased risk for kidney disease, including HIV-associated nephropathy, glomerulosclerosis, immune complex kidney disease, as well as kidney in injury resulting from prolonged exposure to antiretroviral therapies. TDF has been associated with proximal renal tubulopathy. High rates of, higher rates of renal dysfunction have been reported in patients using TDF in conjunction with ritonavir containing boosted regimens. An alternative to TDF is TAF, which may be used if creatinine clearance is greater than 30 mils per minute and in patients on chronic hemodialysis. TAF has less impact on renal function and lower rates of proteinuria compared to TDF. Also consider avoiding atazanavir, which has been associated with chronic kidney disease in some observational studies. Low bone mineral density has frequently been observed among individuals with HIV, leading to osteopenia and osteoporosis with a high prevalence of fractures compared to the general population. The risk of osteoporosis increases as people age. Anyone can get osteoporosis, but it is more common in older women. HIV infection and some HIV medicines may increase the risk of osteoporosis in people living with HIV. Other risk factors for osteoporosis include a diet low in calcium and vitamin D, physical inactivity and smoking. These risk factors can be managed by lifestyle changes. For example, getting enough calcium and vitamin D and staying active makes bones stronger and helps to slow bone loss. Again, tenofovir is associated with a decreases in bone mineral density along with the renal tubulopathy that we mentioned earlier. It is also associated with urine phosphate wasting, with resultant osteomalacia, and TDF should be avoided in people with HIV who are at risk for bone density loss. TAF is associated with smaller declines in bone mineral density compared to TDF. Integrase inhibitor containing regimens represent a good option to reduce the impact of antiretroviral therapy on bone, especially in patients with pre-existing low bone mineral density.
people living with HIV may develop a spectrum of cognitive, motor, and or mood problems collectively known as HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder, or HAND. Typical symptoms include difficulties with attention, concentration and memory, loss of motivation, irritability, depression, and slowed movements. Previously known as AIDS dementia complex, HAND is directly related to HIV-associated inflammation, which we will cover in the last part of this talk. The most severe form of HAND, called HIV-associated dementia, or HAD, now occurs in less than 5% of people who have access to antiretroviral therapy. The most common form of HAND is mild neurocognitive disorder, or MND. Symptoms of MND include behavioural changes, difficulty in making decisions, learning, attention, concentration, and memory difficulties. Some patients develop tremors or loss of coordination. A third form of hand has been described in research studies and that is asymptomatic neurocognitive impairment or ANI. Study participants with ANI may have impaired performance on neuropsychological tests but don't exhibit any recognisable symptoms. Early studies suggest that these patients do poorly on tests that evaluate daily function, suggesting that real impairment is there, but it's just not recognised. Others note that participants with ANI are more likely to develop symptomatic impairment, such as MND, than participants who test normally on cognitive testing. The figure on this slide summarises the breakdown of HAND in its various forms. Although advances in antiretroviral therapy over the past two decades have decreased the severity of HAND, symptoms still persist in 30 to 50% of people living with HIV. For many people, these symptoms continue to affect activities of daily living. A 2019 systematic review showed no clinical trials of HAND therapies that were effective beyond effective viral suppression. So the primary medical intervention at this time for HAND is to achieve viral suppression with antiretroviral therapy and achieve a CD4 count of more than 200. In terms of antiretroviral therapy, um, it's recommended to avoid rilpivirine-based regimens as both efavirenz and rilpivirine can exacerbate psychiatric symptoms which may be associated with suicidal thoughts. Patients on integrase-based regimens who have pre-existing psychiatric conditions should be closely monitored as integrase inhibitors have been associated with adverse neuropsychiatric effects in some cohort studies. Turning now to another comorbidity, and that's, that's diabetes. So the prevalence of diabetes in people living with HIV has been reported as between 2 and 14%, with data coming from cohorts in Europe, North America and Africa. There is conflicting evidence on whether HIV is an independent risk factor for diabetes. Some studies report an increased risk of diabetes in people living with HIV, and some show no association. The data presented on the right side of the slide in the graph were presented at the AIDS 2018 conference in Amsterdam. And the study summarised in the graphic support the notion that the prevalence of type 2 diabetes does not seem to be increased in people with HIV. Screening to detect type 2 diabetes and assess risk for future diabetes is the same for those with and without HIV infection, with the exception of the caveat around the use of haemoglobin A1C, which underestimates glycemia in people living with HIV, and the use of HbA1c may underdiagnose and undertreat diabetes in people with HIV. Screening for diabetes should be considered at, in adults at any age, if they are overweight or obese, 
and anyone who has a risk factor for diabetes, including physical, activi physical inactivity, family history, high-risk ethnicity, hypertension, and women with a history of gestational diabetes or the delivery of a high birth weight baby. In those without risk factors, screening for diabetes is recommended from the age of 45 onwards. People with HIV should be screened at HIV diagnosis or before initiating ART and then annually after that. Generally, type 1 diabetes presents with acute symptoms of diabetes and markedly elevated blood glucose levels and in most cases should be diagnosed as soon as the onset of hyperglycemia is diagnosed. We will finish this webinar on the related topics of chronic inflammation and the management of frailty. This is the learning objective for module four to recognize the impact of HIV on chronic inflammation and the management of frailty. HIV is a chronic infection. Uh, ongoing inflammation persists even with viral suppression. The consequences of HIV-associated chronic inflammation are an increased risk of non-AIDS comorbidities such as cardiovascular disease and cancers, premature aging and frailty. In people living with HIV, most age-related comorbidities are associated in fact with chronic low-grade inflammation. Chronic inflammation in HIV arises mainly from a gut breach that occurs early in infection. The breach is followed by microbial translocation, which activates multiple immune components and is not fully rescued by antiretroviral therapy. T cells are activated, memory B cells and natural killer cells have abnormal function neutrophils become suppressed and platelets are activated. Monocytes and macrophages become pro-inflammatory and their activation is associated with systemic inflammation, which subsides when treated, but does not return to normal. Multi-organ systems are affected by this chronic inflammation, including heart, brain, liver, and kidney. Other comorbidities are increased, including cardiovascular disease, lipodystrophy, reduced neurocognitive function, cancer and frailty, all of which are associated with increased levels of inflammation. Even with effective treatment and viral load suppression, inflammation continues to drive an increased risk of these comorbidities, especially as people live longer. Here are some examples of comorbidities which occur earlier and more frequently, even with sustained viral suppression, compared to people who do not have HIV. In people with HIV, inflammation contributes to earlier onset and increased frequency of mortality, cardiovascular disease, cancer, venous thromboembolism, type 2 diabetes, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, renal disease, bacterial pneumonia, cognitive dysfunction, depression and frailty. In the final section of this presentation, we will discuss age-related comorbidities and frailty, noting that dysregulated inflammation has been consistently associated with frailty in elderly HIV-infected, uninfected persons. As discussed earlier in this webinar, dysregulated inflammation is also central to HIV pathophysiology and several studies have demonstrated the association of inflammation with frailty in people living with HIV. This conceptual model of aging with HIV infection depicts how the combination of structural and behavioral factors directly contribute to reduce quality of life and a healthy lifespan. According to this model, structural inequities such as gender, race, education and employment, plus biobehavioural bio factors such as alcohol and substance use and smoking, combined with low self-efficacy, combined with chronic inflammation, here called inflammaging, caused by HIV to drive chronic in immune activation, low resilience and physical and neurocognitive impairment and reduced quality of life. 
As people with HIV live longer, they are facing different health challenges and cardiovascular disease is now one of the leading causes of death among people living with HIV. Many other age-associated comorbidities occur more frequently in people living with HIV compared to those who do not have HIV. As discussed earlier in this webinar, these comorbidities include cardiovascular disease, cancer, osteoporosis, bone fractures, chronic obstructive airways disease, liver and kidney disease, cognitive decline, and frailty. So what is, what is frailty? Frailty is defined as a clinical syndrome in which at least three of the following criteria are present. Unintentional weight loss, self-reported exhaustion, weakness as measured by grip strength, slow walking speed, and low physical activity. The, the data on the right side of the slide come from the age HIV cohort in the Netherlands. As you can see in the figure, frailty and pre-frailty occurred at an earlier age and was more common in people living with HIV in the right side of the graph compared to people who did not have HIV on the left side of the graph. Overall, the prevalence of frailty was 10% amongst people with HIV compared to 3% for people without HIV. In primary care practice, recognition of frailty offers the opportunity to identify and optimise management of coexisting conditions that might contribute to or be affected by frailty and mitigate stresses that might precipitate adverse outcomes. Measuring frailty is not difficult using the simplified formula from Freed and colleagues, which is shown on the graph. If none of those criteria are present, that's robust. If one to two of the criteria are present, this defines the person as being pre-frail. And if more than three of the uh, attributes are present, that defines frailty. Frailty in persons with HIV has been associated with adverse outcomes, including incident cardiovascular disease, diabetes, recurrent falls and fractures, lower quality of life scores, cognitive impairment, hospitalisation and death. Although the frailty phenotype is still incompletely characterised in people with HIV, its early detection to target interventions may improve the well-being of this population. Again, from the AGE HIV cohort study in the Netherlands, frailty was a strong predictor of mortality and incident comorbidity, regardless of HIV status. Frailty was more prevalent among HIV positive individuals and HIV status was associated with frailty progression. These results provide guidance to clinicians in recognised patients at risk for developing frailty and associated adverse health outcomes and illustrate the importance of maintaining physical and mental health. Evidence suggests that the following interventions may reduce the risk of frailty. Assessing and managing comorbidities, reducing risk factors such as smoking, increasing exercise and optimising body mass index, and improving personal and community resources. Management of frail seniors may include medication review, more frequent outpatient visits with the primary care physician, exercise interventions for strength, endurance and balance training, and informed discussion about the risks associated with surgical procedures. Because frailty is a predictor of survival, identification of frailty might help to determine the appropriate, appropriateness of preventive interventions, helping physicians to individualise care for their ageing populations. We have covered a lot of ground in this talk and the information presented is really an overview of the topics. References are provided throughout the presentation for more in-depth review. And just to recap, we discussed integrated non-oral ARV formulations into clinical practice in module one switching antiretroviral regimens in virally suppressed patients in module two, antiretroviral selection criteria for patients with comorbidities in module three, 
and the concept of HIV-related inflammation and frailty in the final Module 4. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for participating in this IAPAC Learning Academy educational activity. I appreciate your commitment to delivering quality, person-centered HIV care that leaves no one behind. Now more than ever, our efforts must be focused on regaining momentum to avert AIDS-related deaths, stem new HIV infections, and eliminate HIV-related stigma. As a clinician, you are critical to those efforts.